Ladies and gentlemen, will you welcome uh, Major General Mike Jeffrey. Much, uh, Tony, to General Peter Cosgrove, to Lady Martin, and members of the Sir David Martin uh, Foundation, to other distinguished guests, and in particular to my old friend and fellow Special Force compatriot Jack Sue and his family. It's a wonderful pleasure to be with you all today to assist in the launch of Blood on Borneo, a book that I'm sure you will find enthralling, interesting, and a very vivid account of Jack's unique experience as a member of Z Special. But to be a Z Special was special. First, you had to be a volunteer. And as Alan Jones rightly brought out, and as every serviceman knows, one of the first rules of military life is never to volunteer for anything. <laughs> but to be a Z Special, you not only had to break that golden rule, you had to be a volunteer for hazardous service, an often unspecified service of that. Then you had to prove, through a very demanding training regime, that you had what it takes to do the job. This included being a demolition expert, being able to operate limpet mines on sea attack on ships, being able to bring down power lines with deck cord or whatever, cutting a railway line or blowing a bridge, a wide variety of weapons, including the enemies. You had to be comfortable operating in the claustrophobic environment of a submarine and brave enough to throw oneself out of an aeroplane into the pitch black of the night into the hostile jungle below. And I don't know how many of you here, other than our guest of honour, have uh, done many jumps, but when you stand in the door at night time in an aeroplane and about to throw yourself into that environment, and all you can see is the sparks from the engine, and you're wondering whether the sparks are going to set your parachute alight, and when you eventually get out of the door, you can see nothing, and your feet stretch and stretch and stretch, waiting to hit the ground, and of course you don't hit the ground, and just as you relax, that's when you go whack, and that's when you find yourself a hundred foot up a jungle tree in big trouble. <laughs> so parachuting at night in the hostile territory and jungle is not very attractive. Additionally, and very importantly, Z specials were expected to live, fight and survive for long periods of time in a small group environment, with the added and extreme stress of being behind the lines, operating from a clandestine patrol base in the inhospitable jungle and never totally sure that the local people who knew you were there would not report you to the Japanese with the terrible consequences that that would inevitably follow. They lived in mosquito-infested mudflats in the steaming heat of the jungle and by deliberate choice in close proximity to a cunning and ruthless enemy. The theory being, and I think it was a good one, of the closer you lived to the enemy, the less likely you were to be detected. In the course of their reconnaissance duties, they reported through tenuous communication links on Japanese troop movements, headquarters, and Allied POW camp locations. You probably don't realise, but Z Specials, of whom Jack was one, trained over 6,000 locals as guerrillas, and in their raiding role, they killed over 1,700 of the enemy for the loss of 112 of their own. Of the latter, a number died as a result of torture under brutal interrogation or were executed by beheading. And there are some wonderfully inspiring stories in Jack's book on the bravery and even the cheerfulness with which those Zen men faced the execution of sword. I might add that indigenous and Chinese supporters of the Z specials suffered even more severely. It is in the context of this unique, dangerous and demanding environment that that Jack Sue, Distinguished Conduct Medal Justice for Peace, a former RAF press sergeant, rescue boat sergeant, who volunteered for Z Special, has written his enthralling, enthralling series of stories in this most interesting and readable book, Blood on Borneo. Taken from notes hastily compiled from a wartime diary and aided by a phenomenal memory the book does not follow a sequential pattern. Rather, it's a random collection of Jack's experiences, impressions and observations during nine months spent on active operations behind Japanese lines. There are many thrilling anecdotes, 
Jack tells how and his mate, he and his mate Don Harlan were their Malay guerrillas, wiped out a 10-man Japanese garrison in the town of Tuzan. They located and opened a safe containing Japanese occupation currency, lots and lots and lots of it, which they gave to the Malay villagers, who, recognising its intrinsic worth, used it as high-quality toilet paper. <laughs> Another story involving Don tells of his deep distress and terrible anger at finding the crucified and partly cannibalised body of an Australian soldier on the Sandakan to ram our track. And as we've heard today, only six of the estimated 2,400 allied POWs survived this infamous death march. 160 or 170 odd submarines that were based in Fremantle used to call in and refuel before they went up into the Timor Sea. And to go to this place at night time and to see the big oil tank and the pipe on the little jetty and to picture in one's mind these submarines coming in by themselves, uh, refueling and going off to do their job, many of them never to return, was, was a very eerie but a very, uh, a, a very poignant moment. And one of those submarines, USS Harder, took out five Japanese destroyers on one patrol. But I digress. For sheer audacity and courage, Jack's solo effort in entering the Japanese-held railway station at Bongawan, dressed as a coolie, stands supreme. Approaching the Chinese station master, Ah Lee, and speaking in local dialect in the close presence of Japanese officers and troops, Jack persuades Ali to give vital information on enemy troop train movements. This data was then used to great effect by the US Air Force on bombing and strafing missions in preparation for the planned Allied invasion of British North Borneo. This incident, in the sense of the necessarily intimidatory language that Jack had to use on Ali, caused Jack very deep personal distress for many years until he was able to return to Borneo after the war, quite recently in fact, and make his peace with Ali and his family, who generously enough seemed to bear no ill will, to, Ill, Ill will towards either Jack or the Z Special. And so the stories unfold, some on the operational aspects of life behind the lines, others on the mostly calm and attractive village people who supported Z Special, whilst interleaved through it all is Jack's fascination with the beautiful flora, fauna and undersea life of Borneo. There's a wonderful little cameo of Jack's New Zealand mate, Staff Sergeant Graham Greenwood, strolling down a jungle track on his early morning constitutional, quietly reading his Bible, when suddenly he comes face to face with a huge and equally surprised six foot six orangutan. And this was at a distance of about eight feet. And Staff Sergeant Greenwood had a decision, either to turn and try and run away, or to steer this gorilla out. And what did he do? Staff Sergeant Greenwood took two paces forward, which took him about four feet from the gorilla, of the orangutan. The orangutan took two paces forward. Staff Sergeant Greenwood took another pace forward. The orangutan did the same, and eventually they just bypassed each other <laughs> on the same <laughs> <laughs> And then there's uh, another story which I think uh, shows Jack is, uh, Jack's impish sense of humour, and I hope the ladies will forgive me to, for a little bit, but uh, the Z Specials have recruited two very demure, attractive, and normally happy Chinese nurses to a town called uh, Lockerpass to uh, where they were to look after the Malay guerrilla fighters and their families. And suddenly uh, the demeanour of these two girls suddenly changed from being happy and uh, cheerful and all that sort of thing to being quite morose and very unhappy. And Jack had to find out why this was so. And it was with great difficulty that he did so. But eventually the two girls took him into the little medical store of this little jungle uh, 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 hospital. And there in this great big uh, kerosene tin was full of condoms. And you can see why the two Chinese little girls were a little bit apprehensive. <laughs> but Jack being Jack explained what it was for. It was for a military mission. These condoms were to be placed around detonators and detonating cordon on the ends of rifles to protect them from the jungle rain. And I told that the two little Chinese two girls were smiling forever afterwards after that. 
of particular moment is Jack's deep affection for his special mates, and in particular his guide, mentor, and father figure, Gord Chester, a painter by profession, a charismatic leader, and a man of great personal charm and integrity. And all these things come together in wonderful little stories packed with instant, keen observation and wise reflection. As Jack himself says in his introduction, this is not intended as a great literary or military historical work. Rather, it is a collection of stories of supremely brave men living, fighting and dying in that most traumatic of war situations behind the Japanese lines in a jungle environment where the risk of capture, torture and execution was always high. Yet Jack and his compatriots of Z Special took that risk willingly and bravely and in so doing made a noble contribution to the defeat of a tough, <coughs> courageous but extremely cruel enemy. I congratulate the author Jack Sue, himself a man of great humility, charm and courage, for bringing an important part of the history of Z Special to the public's attention in such a readable, stimulating and memorable way. It's a book that should be read by all Australians and I'm delighted to be honoured to be able to launch it today. Thank you very much.